But thank you all for coming. And again, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. And I want to thank you for organizing this fabulous conference. Um, it's been wonderful so far. And on a subject that I think is not often discussed enough. So it's wonderful to be talking about th these things finally. Um, and I think my, my talk goes well with the one that came before. Yeah, yeah, and the uh, speaker is still here. Um, it's a totally different subject, but it also seems to me it's also about silences and what, but here in this case, what poetry does with the kind of consciousness of subaltern people uh, who are not reflected in the literature. So that's really the, the Hakani's um, sort of obsession and his contribution. Um, to this conference. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, one specific poem, but also framing it uh, in the context of the genre of which it is uh, a, a major uh, example um, that I was the subject of my dissertation and now a book project, the Hapsiat. Um, and also framing that within the context of looking at how uh, the poet uses uh, Islamic legal discourse in his poetry. Um, okay, so uh, over the course of the 12th, uh, 6th, 12th century, a genre small in volume but large in ambition that was both stimulated in and shaped by the materiality of the prison flourished along the edges of the vast terrain of Persian literary culture stretching from Lahore to Azerbaijan. This genre, called the Habsiyat, is the medieval Islamic world's most aesthetically compelling corpus of texts dealing with incarceration. Uh, originating during the Ghaznavid period uh, in, in Lahore, the Habsiyat flourished particularly under the Shirvan Shahs, um, a dynasty that ruled northern Azerbaijan and parts of southern Dagestan from their capital in Shirvan. Um, from Shirvan, Habsiyat spread across the Persianate world um, into, again, South Asia later uh, and other parts of Central Asia. Um, and now I'm focusing on um, Haqqani, who is, I at least regard as the the, the master of, of the Habsiyat genre, and um, looking at how he uses uh, what he terms in the poem I'll be discussing, uh, the belt zunar of, of oppression, uh, by incorporating into his poetics a discriminatory discourse for dealing with non-Muslim peoples, and how this discourse was reframed through his prison poetry. An anecdote concerning Hakani will help, help to set the stage for the journey through texts, politics, and narratives that follow. As recorded by the 19th century uh, Persian historian Baki Hanov, uh, who based his account on the 15th century uh, Persian literary history of Daulat Shah Samarkandi, Hakani uh, decided to renounce, while he was living in, in Shirvan, um, he decided suddenly to renounce worldly life and embark on a pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. Uh, his patron, however, Manuchir, uh, didn't want him to go. He didn't want to give him permission. Uh, so they had a sort of power game. Uh, he denied permission. But Haqqani uh, had a taste for poverty, and he would not let any ruler's dictates get in the way of his spiritual ambitions. Uh, so he, he left. Um, and, but then when he arrived in Baila Khan, uh, not far from Shirvan, um, he was captured by the agents of his patron slash ruler, um, and he was compelled to return uh, and face the consequences of having violated the wishes of the great king. Although Baki Hanaf does not say whether the poet was imprisoned for insubordination after he was captured, Dalat Shah does say that he was imprisoned for five months in the fortress of Shabaran, um, which is uh, near Darband um, in the region of Shirvan. Uh, he was suffused with sorrow. It's, it's a very uh, sort of the trope of him being imprisoned occurs again and again in the biographical literature, so um, it, it's very rhetorically described. Uh, he was suffused with sorrow, and but these months of, of imprisonment were a stimulus for the poets first. And I said, we don't necessarily assume that the poems were actually composed in prison, but the, tr the literary trope is that they were. Um, the poet's refusal to let his peregrinations be contingent on the ruler's will became habitual and led to many similar subsequent imprisonments. Not long after his first failed escape, Haqqani succeeded in leaving Azerbaijan and embarked on a lengthy journey through the two Iraqs um, that led him all the way to Mecca. When he returned to Shirvan, he was immediately thrown in prison, from which location he composed um, his Habsiyat. There are six um, Habsiyat that are identified as such in his... In his um, Divan, but really many more than that are, are have the, the atmosphere of being, they write about imprisonment. It's, it's a theme that runs throughout more than six of his poems. Um, characteristically of the complex maneuvers that marked the prison poem's political trajectory, Baki Hanav prefaces his account of the poet's rebellion by stating that Haqqani celebrated the glory of his patron ruler, the same one who imprisoned him. 
Um, so he's part of the, these poems are panegyric, they're typical Casitas, and, but another half is the cr criticism of the ruler. Um, here as elsewhere in the Persian literature of incarceration, the regimes against which prison poets rebelled were also the regimes they glorified in their oeuf. Haqqani was neither the first nor the last Persian poet to compose literary monuments to incarceration, but because his disputes with his ruler were poetically generative and politically subversive, and that I think is what's distinctive about his poetry, uh, that there is a political undercurrent to them. Uh, that's, that, that's different from other prison poets. Um, in equal measures, this exploration of the genre that was brought to its apogee of poetic excellence in Shirvan begins with the recurrent tensions between the poet's desire for freedom to travel and his ruler's desire to confine his most gifted poet to a prison cell. While the prison functioned at times in the Persian literature of incarceration as a synecdoche for the general confinement within which the most promising literary talents of the era were trapped, neither the prison cell nor the manifold rules and regulations that were intended to police the movements of poets across medieval borders could succeed in silencing the poet's subversive utterance. Uh, to the contrary, these external constrictions stimulated the genesis of the prison poem as a genre. The more constricted the conditions under which the prison poem wrote, poets wrote, the more the prison poem acquired force, salience, and necessity. Uh, so this, this genre has not really been, um, there's, a, there's a book on it in Persian, um, and beyond that, uh, not no systematic studies, no attempt to, to really make sense of why. That, for me, is the, the big question is why did it suddenly become very popular uh, to write about being in prison. I think that has to be seen in, in political historical terms, uh, it, as well as in rhetorical terms, right? Um, it's, it's something, there was a, uh, changes really in the sources of power, I would say broadly. Um, and, and that hasn't, th these questions have not really been asked of, of the genre. Um, um, but, and, and also the, the incredible range within a period of 50 years that I won't be talking about this in any detail now, but the fact that Masud Esad is Salman of Lahore was writing um, in, in the 1120s and then 50 years later you have a, flour a very rapid flourishing of the genre in, um, in Shirvan and then it becomes popular in Delhi also very quickly after. And also that there's, there are accounts of poets uh, from these circles uh, teaching their, their pupils to write prison poetry without really being in prison. So, so the key, so then again, it's about the aestheticization of imprisonment and what the, the particular function of that aestheticization did at that moment in time. Um, and uh, right, most saliently for the study of the relations between poetry, polity and poetry in medieval Islamic society, Haqqani's prison poems incorporate the language and imagery of a corpus of Islamic legal texts that stipulated how religious minorities um, were, to, were to be treated under Islamic law. So this is a body of work um, that is uh, known as the Shurut Umar, or the Pact of Umar. Uh, it's, a, it's a short text, uh, a letter um, that circulates in many different, uh, different, different versions uh, with minor variations in various mirrors for princes, legal texts. Um, and, and that's, again, this is, this is what's unique about Hahani's prison poetry specifically, that he makes creative use of, of this um, textological tradition. Beyond its salience, and I'll be talking a lot more about that in a second, I just wanted to set it up because it, in case it's not a familiar um, uh, tradition for you. Beyond its salience for the history of incarceration, the prison poem offers an exemplary case study of the work done by genre and the world. From within the Panagyra Casita, traditionally reserved for praise of the patron or king, and from within the courtly ethos this form fostered, prison poems complicated the power relations governing classical literary forms. The complex um, political and aesthetic history of the prison poem enables scholar, scholars of literary culture to rethink the relations among genre, ideology, and form with specific attention to the subaltern possibilities opened up by Persian poetry. Um, so th what's distinctive about the, the uh, Qasida, the Christian Qasida, the Qasida i Tarsaya, um, is its engagement with um, Eastern Orthodox Christian theology, as well as a lot of references actually to the Zoroastrian tradition. It's a sort of amalgam of all the non-Muslim religious traditions in, into a single Qasida. And um, this, this poem has been um, the subject of a masterful study uh, by Vladimir Minorsky, a Russian Orientalist. Um, uh, who I spent a long time in, in the UK also. Um, and uh, he posited that the uh, addressee of the poem was uh, the Byzantine emperor Andronicus Komnenus, 
um, who visited Azerbaijan as a guest of the Georgian king, uh, um, George III, uh, when uh, Hakani, around the time that he was in prison. Um, and he posited that based on a lot of sort of references within the text uh, and, and the, the fact that it, it's really a unique text in that um, it goes beyond, well, as Minorsky showed, that Hakani draws on um, Christian traditions, not just Islamic interpretations of, of the, the Bible, but actually uh, seems to have some knowledge of Greek and of different languages. So it seems to be addressed potentially to even to a non, his, he posited at least that it was addressed to a, a non-Muslim ruler. That sense been contested. But, but the point is just that, that it, it attests to the, the kind of cultural multiplicity that's inherent in this, in this Christian kasida. Um, uh, so just a few years prior to his sojourn in Georgia and Azerbaijan, Andronikis Komnenus had himself escaped from 12 years of imprisonment um, for conspiracy against the emperor of Byzantium, Manuel I. Had Hakani been aware of the convergence be his, between his bio biography and that of the Byzantine prince, it might have stirred his feelings of solidarity. Uh, whether or not such solidarity animated his imagination, the Christian Casita is the most detailed Persian engagement with Eastern Orthodox Christianity up to that period, at least in, in Persian poetry. Um, finally, as a text written by a Muslim poet whose Nestorian Christian mother had converted to Islam, and this is uh, according to his own account in the Tufa al uh where he describes his mother being forcibly converted to Islam, again, People have challenged that, said maybe it's a trope, maybe he's just trying to present himself as a victim, but you know, I guess we can't really get at that. So the point is that he made, that's part of his own self-narrative, that he was descended from a woman who was originally an historian Christian. Um, the Christian Casita is notable for pushing the doctrinal boundaries of Islam while giving voice to Islamic piety. Um, the Christian Casida elaborately figures the incarcerated Muslim poet as Jesus Christ, the Islamic prophet and Christian savior. And I, of course, have to, this is an extremely rich text, uh, so there's no way to even cover a quarter of it in a, in a presentation. So I won't, I just want to give you a little, I mean, I'll be I'll give you very, very little samples, not, not a full treatment of the poem, but um, one thing that I, I didn't write here, it, there's a, it opens with a uh, metaphor with the bars, the bars on, on his window cell, um, and that immediately stirs in him the, the perception that he is Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, and, that, so that, and that then becomes a recurrent uh, trope of prison poetry as such, uh, that, that the, the imprisoned poet is uh, affiliated with with, with Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, that even, even there's a poem in uh, 20th century uh, uh, Pakistan by the poet Faiz, Ahmed Faiz, who's, who's referencing Haqqani's Christian Qasida. So it really uh, strikes, a, strikes a, a chord. Um, uh, so beyond this particular conceit of the poet as prophet, which is one of his Haqqani's hallmarks, uh, he was gifted with a very profound sense of his own genius. Um, uh, Hakani's uh, Christian Kasida adds a new political charge to the genre's complex engagement with Islamic sovereignty. Um, it incorporates the discourse of usul al-fiqh into its poetics, rhetoric, and tropology. Manorsky's masterful exegesis of the Christian Kasida serves as the foundation for all subsequent scholarship on the poem, including in Persian, uh, Zadin Kub uh, translated Manorsky's uh, uh, article into Persian and then added his own commentary. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a foundational uh, work of scholarship. Manorsky did not, however, document the substantial inter intersections between these Sharut texts that I briefly mentioned, um, the, pertaining to the Ahl al the, the protected peoples, Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians, and Hakani's poem. So that, that's something that I, um, it, it's, it's there if you, if you read the poem, but it hasn't really, I, I don't, no scholar to my knowledge has actually gone deep into, into the presence of, of, of the, the intersection between this, this Persian text and, and that body of literature. Um, like other modern readers of Haqqani, Minorsky left unexplored this aspect of um, a Muslim-Christian relations in the medieval Caucasus, nor did he explore the influence of Islamic discourse on, on um, Haqqani's poem. So by bringing Minorsky's achievement with respect to Haqqani's poetics into conversation with the primary and secondary sources pertaining to the Pact of Umar, um, I'll now briefly demonstrate how the Persian poetry of incarceration was enriched uh, by Islamic legal norms. Concurrently, I will suggest that prison poets such as Haqqani were acutely conscious of the literary, which is to say the rhetorical status of Islamic legal conventions concerning the regulation of non-Muslims, because this is a hugely controversial uh, area in terms of the research on this uh, Pact of Umar that I'll be going through point by point in a second. But 
it's, it's, it's a legal text that dates from, it's, it's attributed to um, a very early Islamic period, and some people say it's fictional, that, you know, and, and to what extent, just because it was on the books as the way that non-Muslims were supposed to be treated, how was that implemented? It obviously varied according to time and circumstance, right? Um, if you, I think, I think looking at the presence, the Haqqani's use of these tropes, to me that, that adds strength to the, the reading it more, more as a rhetorical, as a rhetorical um, at least in this, in this particular context of, of, of the world that he was living in. I mean, he, he was clearly conscious of it as, as a rhetorical body of literature that could be appropriated and played with these, these regulations. Uh, the interface between prison poem poetics and Islamic jurisprudence eloquently demonstrates the ways in which in medieval Islamic society, poetry and law, Inhibited, inhabited uh, conceptually proximate spheres of intellectual inquiry and how this proximity extended poetry's political scope while also infusing the social discourse of Islamic law with the poetic imagination. Taking serious account of Haqqani's engagement with Islamic legal discourse can also help us better understand how religious difference was negotiated on borderlands of Islamic empires by Muslims who had more contact with non-Muslims than did their more centrally located counterparts. Like the prison poem in Persian literary history, uh, which is fascinating that, that it's actually in it's another mystery of this genre is that it, it was very popular on the borderlands of the Islamic world. So Shirvan, Lahore, these are both areas that are in contact with many, many non-Muslims. And even in Lahore, uh, the trope, there too you find the trope of, of Christian trope, tropes in this. So there was some interest in sort of pushing the boundaries of what Islam was. Um, uh, at the same time, the, king, the kingdoms of the Shirvan Shah's peripheral location uh, fostered an environment propitious for the Habsiyat's aesthetic of descent as well as for its critique of, at least as I'm going to argue, uh, critique of Shirut regulations. Um, so I want to suggest that, that Shirvan's geographic marginality generated uh, was, was also part of what enabled Haqqani's own imagination and his own uh, use of the, the Shirut regulations. Um, and yeah, just, just sort of a little bit more of fact, filling in the, the details of, of where he's writing from. Um, this is an area of the Caucasus that is, uh, has Christians, Nestorian Christians, also Albanian Christians. Uh, that's, that's a um, Eastern Orthodox type of Christianity, Zoroastrians. Um, and uh, right, okay, so now I'll, I'll go sort of point by point through the Shirut al-Umar just to get a sense of what, 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 what the standard um, text was that, 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 that he was dealing with. Um, so Ashafi is, is, is probably, or at least I think it's, that it's the version, the, the, the jurist, um, in his Kitab al-Um, he, he contains one of the fullest versions of this text. This is just a brief two or three page um, letter um, from, uh, 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 from the Christians, the Christians of Syria, um, saying that they're, basically they are agreeing that they will, they will abide by the rules of, of the Islamic State. Um, and, and, and in that text, um, he says, uh, or wait, the text, the text is attributed uh, to uh, Omar bin al-Hattab, a companion of the Prophet and the second Islamic Caliph. Um, according to Triton, Ashafi's version of the Pact of Umar originated so, uh, as an exercise in the schools of law to draw, uh, to draw pattern treatises. So it's a kind of paradigmatic text. Um, Triton ar argues that the uses to which the Pact of Umar were put uh, were more literary than practical. Um, that, so that's, that's an early, um, uh, early 20th century um, scholar, of the, one of the first scholars of this, of this tradition. Um, and, uh, and more recent scholarship argues that uh, also it was, it was a text, uh, a, lit a literary form, that there was also in the sense a genre itself. Um, from which everyone, including non-Muslims, understood because they were intimately familiar with the administrative process underlying it. In what follows, uh, some traces of the versions of the Pact of Umar in Haqqani's Christian Qasida are documented. Um, the text of the so-called Pact of Umar is also preserved um, in, in later sources. Um, the Andalusian jurist Al-Tertushi uh, in a work of ethics in a chronicle of Jerusalem by uh, Musharraf uh, bin al-Muraja. Um, and also uh, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya has a version of it. Um, in each of these texts, which are ethical, historiographic, and juridical respectively, the Pact of Umar is, is a putative letter from the Christians of Syria to the Umayyad governor Abu Ubaidah. As Haqqani was later to do in his Christian Qasida, the text of the Pact of Umar speaks on behalf of non-Muslims in the first person plural. That's at least most of the versions. Um, and, and, and as I said, Haqqani himself is also uh, 
opens his poem by identifying with Jesus. He says that I am Jesus, right? So he's, he's mimicking that structure. Um, in this ventriloquized speech, a community of Syrian Christians agree to abide by a long series of negative restrictions set forth by Islamic law. In the version recorded uh, by the contemporary of Hakani Ibn Asakar, these stipulations include, and there's a list of them, um, not raising voices during the recitation of sacred texts, so when they're in their own services, they're supposed to keep their voices low, uh, not displaying crosses in the church, um, in our churches, yielding the road to Muslims, not learning to read the Quran, which I always think is a very interesting one that that was, um, at least again, rhetorically, um, not something that, that pious, uh, good subjects of the Islamic empire were supposed to do. They were not supposed to read the Quran or teach the Quran to the children. It was supposed to be kept from them. Um, not preventing others from converting to Islam. Not resembling Muslims in their clothing, which is something that Haqqani really picks up in his, in his poem. And not imitating them by carrying their weapons. And then there are two more. Um, also, the not, not striking the nakus, the, the bell, the church bell loud, and wearing the zunat, of course, which is a, uh, one of the most recurring features of, of, of the, um, well, one of the ones that, that really impacted Persian poetry. Uh, generally, the stipulations aim at preserving distinctions between Muslims and non-Muslims as distinct social classes um, and at preventing non-Muslim customs from spilling over into the Islamic public sphere while also guaranteeing the right of non-Muslims to practice their faith in certain spaces, such as churches that are clearly demarcated as non-Muslim. So, of course, it is presented as a kind of just text um, at a certain level because it's, it's they're the protected people so it's, it's also creating a space for them in a sense um, it's, it's not um, the framing when these texts are introduced in the islamic literature it's it's never that they're being persecuted it's that they're being protected um, Ashafi offers a distinctive variation on the Shurut al Umariya, the Pact of Umar textual tradition. And I, I should mention also that this, this area of where Hakani is writing from, um, the Shirvan Shahs were Hanafi, but, but the Shafi law was, was predominant and well, very close. So, so that, it seems to me to make sense that um, the Shafi version would have been closest, the easiest for him to access. Um, the jurist reframes the stipulations in other shurut, other, um, uh, other stipulations, by trans transposing them into the second person voice such that they become orders delivered by Muslims to non Muslims. The imperative mode and second person voice impose a burden of responsibility on both sides. Rhetorically, these modes of speech have the paradoxical effect of obliging Muslims to honor the terms of a pact that was devised to constrain and regulate Christian behavior. The responsibilities imposed on Muslims by the terms of the pact are enumerated in greater detail in Shafi's version than in other shurut. For example, a Shafi advises Muslim rulers to incorporate into their treatises with Christians uh, made as part of a payment of taxes, jizya, a statement to the effect that, quote, we grant you safety, aman, as long as you maintain the regulations that we impose on you and that you obey the rules of Islam, uh, hukm al-Islam, and that phrase occurs literally in the Christian Qasida, um, and no others, and that you do not refuse to do anything we ask you. The burdens on non-Muslims are substantial, but so are the obligations on Muslims to protect non-Muslims' lives and property, presuming they are loyal subjects of the Islamic State. Um, right, and, and uh, the Christian Qasida, so turning to the text, um, begins by describing the situation of the poet in prison. As I mentioned, uh, he's complaining about, of course, the falak, uh, the sky, and he looks at the script, um, he, he compares the, the circulation of the stars uh, to the Christian script, Hati Tarsa, that's written from left to right, um, and sees his own fate inscribed into that crookedness. Um, and then uh, he turns to, to a series of delineating the life of Jesus, as I mentioned, going through various biblical stories, um, adding, kind of mixing and matching from the Islamic tradition, from the Christian tradition. Um, and um, and then um, after demonstrating his command of Eastern Orthodox teachings concerning the life of Jesus, uh, Hakani returns to himself. He becomes a poet, him, his own 
uh, self again, and his predicament. Uh, he starts threatening uh, the ruler, his patron, the person who's his jailer, that he wants to travel to Byzantium, and he wants to create his own religion in Byzantium. He's going to open a school there, Dabiristan, in the center of Byzantium. He will make, make fresh the laws of the metropolitan. The, um, so in a sense, he's, he's threatening to become Christian, but to create, really to found his own version of Christianity. Um, and uh, so these verses, right, he's going to, and, and he's going to bring along, Islam along with him. Um, and, and so in a sense, he, he's positioning himself. I mean, he's really trying to, this is again, what, what prison poetry does as a rule. He's changing the center of power, making, as, as a poet, he's, he's incapacitated, he has no power, but he, he's able to imagine himself as the person who's, not, who's creating a new religion. Um, and and he, also he also says that in his religion, uh, they'll be praying in the direction of Jerusalem, as Muhammad did following the migration to Medina. So here's one uh, short ex excerpt uh, where he says that he, he wants, if I search for the threshold of infidelity, the astane kufr, and stop seeking the faith, the path of faith of the supreme leader, uh, what would happen, right? Um, the gate of the Abhazians stands open. Uh, the sanctuary of the Greeks um, is ready to receive me. Um, so it's, it's, it's a threat, basically, um, and not, not just against his, against his immediate patron, but against the order in which he's trapped. Um, and so, so here again, I think uh, he makes, then he makes a turn and, and starts, this is really, the section that follows is where he draws most deeply on this Pact of Umar tradition. Um, for example, there's the, uh, the clause in one of the, the shurut, um, Al that um, where there's a, it's it's forbidden to for the Christians uh, to manifest our, their religion publicly or preach it to anyone, and that's exactly what he's doing as a, as a uh, pseudo Christian. Um, so he proposes to convert to Christianity, um, and right, and then uh, and this for me is maybe the key. The key section of the poem from the point of view of, of the use he makes of the, the Pact of Umar, uh, where he says that he's going to, to kiss the church bell at Avam Nakus Busam Zein Tahkam. And this, that, that, this phrasing like, is, is, is exactly from, even though that's, that's in Arabic, this is in Persian, he's, he, the, the lexicon is, completely mirrors what's in the Pact of Umar. And he's going to wear the Zunar also, which is a pretty, this is, a, as to my knowledge, I'd be interested in other, other people have other examples, but it's a re relatively early usage of, of that term where he, he's literally just going to, I mean, it's, it's a, it seems like a classic case of really claiming a subaltern identity. I, I don't know of earlier examples of it being um, claimed as something that a poet would want to do uh, to, to mark themselves as, as non-Muslims. And then he's going to uh, create a, gos a commentary on the, uh, on the gospel in Syriac, explore the Hebrew script's complexities. Um, so, so, right, the, um, the, the, the political charge of the Nakus in particular was connected to its symbolic challenge to sovereign mm -hmm. power. As Levi Rubin notes, this is a, a study of the Pact of Umar tradition, um, the fact that the right to beat the drums, and especially for prayer, was reserved for the caliph, uh, meant that the beating of the Nakus loudly and in public was an infringement on royal authority. The challenge posed by the Christian Nakus to Islamic sovereignty is reflected in the Habsiyat, as well as in the uh, Pact of Umar regulations. Um, uh, so the relevant uh, clause reads in, in the, the Shirut of Umar, uh, we shall only ring bells in our churches quietly. Um, in other contexts, they were forbidden to ring on certain days. Um, Ashafi takes that so, somewhat farther. Um, and also there's a, a, a prohibition on displaying the cross in Muslim territories, uh, proclaiming polythe polytheism. Uh, or building churches or meeting places for your prayers. You shall not strike the bell. You shall not, pro this is a quote from, from the Shafi text, nor proclaim your polytheism concerning Jesus, son of Miriam, or anyone else to a Muslim. Although Ash Shafi's version is distinguished from other comparable regulations in that it elaborates the rights of the Dhamma to, to set, um, the rights side by side with their obligations. So, so there's an emphasis on the kind of the benefits that comes to them, come to them from these uh, restrictions. Uh, with respect to the restriction on beating the Nakus, uh, Ashafi is stricter than his predecessors. So it's, in other words, it's foregrounded there in a way that is not true of the other texts. And that's, that's the part that Hakani takes and incorporates into his poem. Um, 
so although he draws on Christian teachings concerning the life of Jesus and alludes to Syriac and Hebrew versions of the biblical story, Haqqani writes as a Muslim addressing a community of believers. And that's in a sense that the force of the text comes from, I think. And he does make, again, in, in keeping with the typical Qasida uh, form, he does sort of return back and say, no, I'm not going to go to Byzantium. I want to stay here. I want to serve my ruler, my patron. But he's already spent most of his time threatening uh, to do precisely the opposite. Uh, so the, the turn to Christianity, just like the use of a subaltern identity, is very much a literary device. Uh, but I think it is also very much a political device. And I don't really know of, I'd, I'd love to hear from the audience if there are, you can think of similar examples where this, this uh, Shurut Pact of Umar tradition is used in this way. Um, I think he was perhaps very original in this regard. Um, the poet's identification with a Christian minority, which was partly biographical given his mother's genealogy, but predominantly <coughs> imaginary, intensifies the impact of the verse. Uh, so to bring, bring this to the topic that brings us here today, uh, Khahani has, his, uses a subaltern identity to enhance his poetry and his poetry to vindicate his subaltern identity. Thank you very much. Stay for a second. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the floor? Yeah, hold on. Uh, thank you for this very nice uh, presentation, uh, Rebecca. Uh, just a question. Uh, is it very interesting that, uh, that this Habsiat literature appears on the eastern fringes of the Islamic world and the northwestern fringes? Is there any other example uh, in the central Iranian uh, Persianate lands or Central Asia? And, and was there any connection between uh, Hakan's predecessors and the reference to the Ghaznavid Habsiat poetry? In Lahore. In Lahore, for yes. example. Yeah, he cites, he cites uh, Masud Asad Sam, so certainly he was very closely familiar with it. And how exactly that happened or why, I mean, that's, it's not, not transparent to answer, but, um, but certainly just from citations, intertextuality, competitions, it's very clear that, that they looked, the poets of Shirvan looked to uh, the poets. It wasn't just Masud Asad Salman, but he was, he's the most famous. They looked at that tradition, they cited it, they, they sought to do much, to excel beyond that. And then also um, there are poets from, from Delhi, uh, 50 years after that, as I mentioned, who were citing Khakhani. That was a period of particular popularity. So there was, it was some, it, 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 that, and so in, in Iran, I mean, it really took off more in the, in the 20th century with Bahar, so much, much later. Um, and I, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very peculiar question of why precisely that is, but, it, but it's, I, I mean, I don't think it's controversial to say that, that it was very much directly a, a, a question of influence. I mean, it was, they were consciously modeling themselves after the example of Masud Esad Salman. And Haqqani himself said, I could be much better than him, but I'm, I, he's, yeah, he was the first. Just one brief comment and then mm -hmm. finish. Um, as for this religious um, multicultural references mm -hmm. you mentioned in, in some of the parts of this Qasida, and you think, you thought that it is the first ever example or something like that to, to, to refer to Jewish or Aramaic or, uh, well, look, check the poetry of Nasser Hosro. Mm -hmm. There are a few interesting references for his inclination towards Judaism. Interesting. Uh, and it's, it can be an Ismaili tradition as well, sure. and a personal issue as well, sure. I, I think. Oh, yeah, definitely, I should do that. Um, I just want to add to your comment that Attar also mm -hmm. is obsessed, it seems, with Christian imagery. So right. that's a, a great place to look for that. And I'm, I'm just a bit surprised you didn't touch on his uh, Khaqani Sufi leanings at all. And um, I'm wondering to what extent these tropes can be read in that context. You know, we see Zonar and these kinds of symbols of the sure. other being adopted um, as a way to prove that, you know, mysticism somehow transcends the, the actual rules of Islam, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I don't know. That's, yeah, that, that element is absolutely there. I guess that, that's sort of the dominant thing I mean, that sort of can be found in so many poets. So he, when I think of the, the way the Zunar is used by Hakani, it's not spiritualized in that way. It's just a very concrete, I mean, when he says, I'm going to wear it, there's no, no it, it doesn't have a spiritual connotation mm -hmm. at that particular moment. It's a very kind of oppositional, threat to a ruler. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, that, I mean, certainly an important part of it. He's such a diverse poet, too. Um, but in the, 
I think I think he had a very strong Sufi inclinations. Not I don't think in this particular poem you would find much in the way of Sufism. Right. It's 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 political. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, a fascinating presentation, and just a, a thought for a further right. um, research on that on that uh, sort of topic, just to reverse the thing and to try and see whether in that region of, of Azerbaijan mm -hmm. and Georgia mm -hmm. and Armenia, whether there are Christian poets uh, actually mm -hmm. uh, referring to or making poetry on. Um, with Islamic themes, yes. uh, because my my hunch is that this was very much um, um, a court. Uh, yes. Yeah, they, 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 they just were, liked they were in contact in and, so. and in, uh, in yeah right. in sort of fruitful contact, and there was no uh, you know sort of antagonistic um, attitude towards um, knowledge about Christian um, Christian faith or Christian reality. I just feel that it's it's sort of a a, a courtly theme. Absolutely. Um, you have, you yeah. have. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Manu Chehri's wine mm -hmm. poems, where he's actually using Christian uh, sure. imagery to talk about the wine being in prison. So, you know, I just that, that's true. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and and there's a lot of intermarriage between the courts of Azerbaijan, the Shirvan Shahs, yeah. and the, the Georgian Bagratids. And uh, certainly, there is there is the Seljuks, yes, yeah. and um, uh, the po Persian. Topos of love and so on is com ab dominant. I mean, it's it's the major place where Georgian poets of the time look. So mm -hmm. it's there's no question of very deep interactions. But then, and yeah, I think in the general sort of the day to day life, um, the norm would be coexistence. But again, I still th there is some interest. So then then it becomes even stranger why he would. Uh, sort of make persecution, why well, he would yeah. thematize it, right? And why he would talk about his mother being forcibly converted and so raped, I mean, basically. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, so it's certainly, whether or not it was like a, a historical reality, there was an interest in the violence of religious difference for, for whatever reason as well, yeah. coexisting along with lots of interaction and harmony. Yeah. Oh, okay. Other questions from the floor? Derek, hold on just a sec. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, ha have you observed the um, the sort of bleeding into prose of this hmm. of this kind of stuff? And, and I hate to brand myself as Mr. Yazd here, but um, <laughs> the the um, in the narrative that I that I um, shared yesterday, I sort of cut short this whole piece about in incarceration. Right. But um, but this, I did mention that the the story begins with this framing of a murder of a Christian merchant, and I always thought that was sort of strange. Um, but then the actual story unfolds with this sort of public torture of this figure wow. as he's paraded through the street, and there's sort of stations where he stops and somebody pours urine on him, and then there's another thing where it's just you know sort of miserable, and then he goes into the into the prison when he comes out it's reversed he prays to the street and sort of pours gold on the person who poured cow urine on him and everything and then forgives everybody so uh you know i mean there may not be any connection at all but i wonder how how much prose narratives get influenced by by this kind of stuff right um well i think the 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 poetry is clearly not they're very, it's very, I mean, it's very much of a genre in the sense of kind of yeah, not yeah. real, right? Uh, in the sense that it's, there's an attempt to make a, a fetish out of it to turn it into, not necessarily to correspond to, to a historical reality. Although, again, if they're citing from prose texts like the, the Pact of Umar, that's already tying it to reality. Um, and there are local histor historiographies that write about imprisonment. And so I, I guess I see them as some separate traditions, but it's, it's happening it's in, in that there, there's writing about people being imprisoned, about the suffering in prison. Oh, no, but I meant uh, the, the sort of connection between imprisonment and, and sort of, and Christianity. Ah, yeah, yeah. okay. I haven't, yeah, that I have not, that, that particular trend. Remains really in the, the yeah. literature, yeah. It's, it's, it's just an aesthetic trope. But, but if, I'd like to see this example and see if there is something in prose also. <laughs> okay, thanks. I had myself uh, uh, 
two questions mm -hmm. regarding hi the historicity. Right. First, I I unless I missed my guess, you were saying that this is one of the first examples of prison it's an early literature, example, yeah. early example. Mm -hmm. to, to what extent, uh, it is way outside the, the, the mm -hmm. envelope as it were, but, but we have prison literature today yeah. and we have it in the Iranian tradition as sure. well as elsewhere right. and subcontinent and such. To, to what extent is there some sort of uh, yeah, intentional or unintentional uh, link right. be between that genre and this kind of, are there certain themes that are okay. quite common? Are there references to this earlier right. kind of well, material? The, actually, I would say La, the quote from Lahore Masood is Salman is, is, is definitely invoked by Bahar and by um, uh, even, yeah, I've seen literature from the past few decades too. He's, he is the inaugural prison poet and so exile, of course, comes up. Um, just the theme of being lost away from your homeland. Um, but, it's, but, it, yeah. but it's named. He is named. Yeah, Masood right, is cited. Okay. He's, I mean, he's cited right. uh, by verse by verse. It's it's a more generalized. I mean, I'm for me, there's a difference in the terms of the two projects of the two poets. The poet from Lahore, Masood Asad Salman, and <laughs> Ahani Shirvani. Um, <laughs> Masood Asad is really exile in the sense that it belongs under the rubric of exile poetry, even mm -hmm. though it is about being imprisoned. Uh, it's very lyrical mm -hmm. and very much uh, very introspective. Um, with Haqqani, it's, it's, it's um, more, I mean, it's a confrontational and not, not so much easily um, grafted onto a sort of generalized exile literature. And he's, I mean, there's an awareness of his work, but in the poetic tradition in Iran, um, 20th century, I don't, he doesn't quite take off as much. I, maybe he's just difficult for people. I don't, I'm not quite sure why. Right, I think that's, right. that's, that's us. It. We're done. Thank you very much. Yeah.